tangent equals one half one plus three one plus x cubed. No, so sad. Okay. So it is uh, one half one plus x cubed. The negative a half three x squared. Do we have to simplify? No, we can just plug in. So we plug in the 2, and we get 1 plus 2 cubed to the negative a half, and then 3, 2 squared. Guys? So we get a half. What is 2 cubed? 8 plus 1 is 9. What's the square root of 9? 3. What's the negative a half of 9? A third, right? It would flip it. Just drop it. And then we get 3 times 4, which is 12. So it's going to equal 2. Much nicer tangent. So we get y minus 3, this is my x and my y, equals 2x minus 2. And that's the equation of your tangent. And then it touches in one spot at 2, 3, right? When you have the right equation. Now the normal should run completely perpendicular to that. So M normal is not 2 over 1. It's actually, sorry, it's not 2. It's negative a half. So you get Y minus 3 equals negative a half X minus 2. And that's the equation of the normal. So type that one in. It should be completely perpendicular. Now it's kind of hard when you're looking at it as, looking at it as an x. But if you take the one line and hold it horizontal, like you have a calculator that can move. It doesn't have to be vertical, correct? So turn your one line so that it's horizontal. The other one should be what now? So if one is horizontal, the other one should be vertical, right? So you turn your screen. And then you can check if it actually is perpendicular. you need it to be the opposite direction and you need the rise to be the run and the run to be the rise. Right? Yeah, but that is. I knew you'd get to it because you're smart and figured out how to unrepeat it. Plus <laughs> three? Because in grade 10, John, we were taught that if this was like if this is negative, the perpendicular has to be positive. So the sign has to change. And whatever rise becomes a run and the run becomes a rise. You got it. All right. Remember I told you I'm adding little tidbits of AP as we go along now because I just made you guys do the actual derivative stuff? This is another one. Another extra tidbit. Instantaneous rate of change. I'm recording. <laughs> okay, boy. All right. Instantaneous rate of change is literally just asking you for the derivative at a specific value. That's all it is. First derivative, specific value. Fancy way. Because rate of change is just what? A fancy way of saying what? <coughs> slope. Instantaneous rate of change is the rate of change, the slope at an instant, at like at time four, time seven. Time 1.2, okay? So instantaneous rate of change is the first derivative at a specific x value. Or t value, or whatever the variable might be. Okay? So 
So there's going to be a difference. There's instantaneous and there's average. Okay? So we're going to go through. There's two types. There's instantaneous we'll do today, and then we'll do average today, and then we'll go to our notes that I gave you yesterday, which was implicit. That will be the end of our adding exercise. So instantaneous rate of change. I might say find the instantaneous rate of change. f of x equals x squared minus 5x at x equals 2. So the hardest part of this is knowing that instantaneous rate of change means first derivative. That's the hardest part. Because once you find the first derivative, you're going to plug in 2 and you're done. That's literally all it is. That is it. So, Instantaneous rate of change, first derivative at a specific x value. So we're going to go f prime of x equals what? This one's the best because it's power rule. 2x minus 5. And they don't want f prime of x, they want f prime of 2. So it's 2 times 2 minus 5. So f prime of 2 is negative 1. That's it. Crazy, I know. That's it. Right. So that's the instantaneous rate of change. If I ask you for the instantaneous rate of change, first derivative at a specific value. It's the rate of change at a specific value in an instant. Okay? The other one they ask for is the average rate of change. So they want the average rate of change between two values. That's it. They want the average between two values. Average rate of change is literally just slope. Not tangent slope. It is grade 10 slope. That is all it is. Average rate of change is slope. You go to grade 10, you do slope of two coordinates. That is it. That is average rate of change. Here's your example. So, find the average rate of change. Guys, please shut up. Find the average rate of change of S of T. equals 20 minus 0 0.8 t squared from 1 to 4. In order to find the slope, I need an x1, y1, x2, y2, correct? Okay, what did they give me? <laughs> What's 1 to 4? What is this? X. 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 Domain. Correct? How do I get the YY? Plug it in. So you're going to find F. Not F. That is not an F at all. That is an S. You are going to find S of 1. Tell me what that is. S of 4. Tell me what that is. And then find the what? Normal old slope y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Try it out. 
So we have 20 minus 0 0.8, guys, 1 squared, which is 19 point what? 2. And then I have 20 minus 0 0.8 times 4 squared, which equals what? So we have 1 and 19.2, 4 and 7.2, x1, y1, x2, y2, or you could do them vice versa. It doesn't matter. You will end up with the same answer. And your slope equals 19.2 minus 7.2 over uh, 1 minus 4. 19.2 minus 7.2 is what? 12 over... Negative 3, what's my average velocity? Average rate. So average rate of change equals negative 4. If they have average velocity, average rate of change, average anything, it's slope. Grade 10 slope. Nothing crazier, not tangent slopes, nothing crazier. So I'm going to get you to open up your notes from yesterday that I gave you. The 3.2 and plus differentiation is halfway through. We have done power rule. We've done product rule. We have two things multiplied. We've done quotient rule. We have two things divided. We've done chain rule when you have to pull out the chain rule first. Or sometimes you have to do chain rule within a product or a quotient rule in order to get f prime or g prime. Correct? What we have not done, though, is we have not actually had x's and y's mixed or you have to do implicit. So, implicit differentiation is used when the equation is not in the form y equals. Okay? So here we're finding... No, don't be frozen. I don't believe your guys' sound like... All right, so... We're going to use implicit differentiation for this one because it's not in y equals. Now, this one you can actually do either way. You could do it implicitly or you can do it without implicit differentiation. It's actually a lot easier to do it without implicit differentiation um, because there's only one y. Do you see how there's only one y in this equation? You are forced to use implicit, differen di implicit differentiation when you have more than one y in an equation. So if you have like an xy plus a y or something like that, you have to do implicit. Okay? So for this one, we're going to not do implicit first. We'll do the normal way first. So we have x, we have x, y minus 4 equals 0. Then we have x, y equals 4. And then we divide by x. So y equals 4 over x. So if I can get it into y equals, I can do normal. Not implicit. Unless it says using implicit differentiation, differentiate the following, then you have no choice. Now, how could I write that so I don't have to do quotient rule? 4x to the negative 1. And then I can do power rule, right? So y prime equals negative 4x to the, what? Negative 2. Nice job, man. And so we get negative 4 over x to the 2. Quick, not hard, easy, correct? Okay. Implicit, you have to use the notation that isn't primes. It's a lot easier if you use the actual notation. I'm going to show it with the notation. You can use the primes later, but I'm going to show you why certain things stay and certain things don't. Okay, we want dy with respect to dx, right? They're asking us for dy over dx. That's what they want their answer to be at the end, not y prime, dy over dx. So technically, I'm wrong with writing it this way. I should write it as dy over dx equals negative 4 over x squared. Because that's what they wanted, not Y prime. All right. Paying attention so I don't lose you. Right? Or you will be lost. So, 
We have x, y minus 4 equals 0. x, y are being what? Multiplied. So what am I going to have to do? No. What rule am I going to have to do differentiated it? Product. product rule. I just said differentiated it. Yep, it's the thing. So we have to do product rule. So we have x times y minus 4 equals 0. The minus 4 is awesome. It's just going to go away when I do derivative of it, right? Here's term 1. Here's term 2. I do each of the terms separately. This one I have to do product rule to. So I do f, which is at, actually I do g. I told you to do g first. So I do g, correct? Now, if this is my f and this is my g, g prime would be the derivative of y, and f prime would be the derivative of x, okay? As of now, we've always had one variable. It's been x or u or m or whatever. It's been one variable, correct? Now I have two. So because it's with respect to x, I take the derivative of x. What's the derivative of an x? 1. And then I go dx over dx. Because I take x with respect to x. What does that do, though? Cancels. So it's just a 1. So that's why when I've done the derivative of x's in the past, we've never wrote dx over dx behind it. Because it just goes away. Right? So we've never shown that to x's. Every time we've done it, we've only had one variable. So what if I do the derivative of y? What's the derivative of a y? 1, and then I get dy over dx. It's with respect to x every single time. So does that one cancel off? No, so I have to keep it. So if I'm using this notation, I do dy over dx. If I'm using the other notation, I could just put a y prime behind it. They're the same thing. But because this one wants it in dy over dx, I have to write it as dy over dx. Okay, so I'm going to get g times f prime. What is f prime? 1 plus f, which is x, times g prime. What's g prime? dy over dx. Minus 4. What's the derivative of negative 4? 0. And then just equals 0. Do you agree? All right. Now I need to get it in dy over dx equals, like this one. Do you see that? So I'm going to go x times dy over dx equals what? Negative y. I can move that over, correct? And then how do I get dy over dx by itself? Divide by x. And often when it's implicit differentiation, it will just stay as negative y over x and they're happy. But does it match that one over there? No. So we actually have to replace the y, because that one doesn't have any y's in it, does it? How do I replace the y? I use this formula here, and I isolate for y. So I have x, y minus 4 equals 0. I already did it over there, just so you know. And then I get x, y equals 4. And then y equals 4 over x. We agree? So I can take this y, I can throw it away, and I can replace it with 4 over x, because that is a true statement. Yes? So I'm going to get negative 4 over x divided by x, which I'm not going to write staffed. So what is that actually? Negative 4 over x times 1 over x, which is negative 4 over x squared. Same answer. So, I'm showing you that you can do this one implicitly, but when there's one y, it is much faster to just isolate the y and do derivatives like normal. Okay? It's when you have two y's that you're going to be in trouble and have to do implicit. Is there two y's in this equation? No, there's one. So I would have picked b to do. Right? I would have solved this by doing b. Yes? All right. Yeah. Nope, the y is 4 over x, and I have a y. So I'm just replacing the y, not the negative sign. So this will end up being homework.
We are in section 3.2 out of your book. Okay, then we're flipping over. So this one still has one Y, but isolating it is pretty intense. Correct? You would still have to move your 3X squared over. You have to divide by 4, put each term to 4. So we're going to do it implicitly anyways. So, um, we have 3x squared plus 4y squared equals 2x. So, this one's actually not as hard to do implicitly because you don't get an embedded y. You'll see. So, um, here we have 3x squared. What's the derivative of 3x squared? 6x. And then technically, if you want to show it, I would get dx over dx. But that just cancels. Do you agree? Plus 4y squared. What do we get? 8y times dy over dx. 8y times dy over dx. <laughs> Equals what? 2. Okay. Everyone agree to this point? There's no product rules in there. There's no chain rules. There's no nothing. Now I need to get the dy over dx by itself. So what am I going to do? Subtract the 6x from both sides. So I get 8y times dy over dx equals 2 minus 6x. And then how do I get dy over dx by itself? Divide by 8y. And now I have dy over dx equals 2 minus 6x over 8y. And they'll leave it like this. They'll leave the y be there. You could have left the y be at the other one too. They just probably won't have that answer there, right? If when you're done deriving it, the answer for the multiple choice isn't there, you might have to solve for y and input it. They won't on these big convoluted ones, so they'll leave it. You can cancel out a 2. Sure. You are shaking. <laughs> so excited. So you can take a 2 out, and you're left with 1 minus 3x over 8y. Yeah, I'm just canceling. <laughs> All right. So this would be your problems in that section. Okay, here it says, find an equation of the tangent line to the graph 3x squared plus 4y squared equals 2x at the point 1, 2, or 1 half, and negative 1 quarter. If you haven't noticed, it's the same equation. Do you see it? So we've already found m tangent, have we not? So m tangent, the general m tangent, equals 1 minus 3x over 4y. What's the only difference here to get m tangent when it's implicit? You have to plug in an x and a y. That's it to get your tangent slope. So this is your x, this is your y, I want you to plug it in to get your tangent slope, and then I want the equation. Go. So, you have 1 minus 3 times a half over 4 times negative a quarter. 3 times a half is 3 halves, correct? Because you do numerator times numerator. Denominator times denominator. So you get 1 minus, a half, mi 1 minus 1 1.5, which is negative 0.5, correct? Or negative a half. And then these cancel, and you get negative 1, which is a half. So we have the tangent slope, we agree? What would the normal be if I asked you for the normal? Negative 2. Negative two. Same work, negative 2. So now we have y minus a minus a quarter equals a half x minus a half.
Now the joy really begins. Okay. Once again, here's some work. These are not crazy. You'll be just fine. The catch is, is that, okay, I'm going to explain to you right now where the downfall lies in derivatives. You guys will spot quotient rules because they literally look like division. They're, it's hard to miss it, correct? You will not do product rules. You will look at this and you will say, oh, I'll do the derivative of e to the y times the derivative of cos. That's what you do all the time. Not what we need to do. We have an e to the y multiplied by a cos x. And if people are like, I will never do that, so are you all will. I have taught this way too long. I know it's what you do. You don't spot product rules, quotient. It's kind of very more, much more obvious, okay? So when you have two things side by side, please put a different colored, I put a different colored dot in between them every single time to remind myself that I have two things multiplied and therefore have two product rules. So, and this is my F, this is my G. F prime would be what? What's the derivative of E to the X? E to the X. What's the derivative of E to the Y? E to the Y, but what do we have to remember to follow behind with? DY over DX. Now, is this in dy over dx form? Do you see this? What is this in? y prime. So can we just do this form because we like it better? No, we have to do whatever form they like better. Good choice of question. So I'm actually going to write f prime as ey, and then dy over dx is just y prime. It's the same thing. Now, a lot of you will like y prime better. You don't have a choice. You have to do whatever form they ask. So it's e to the y, y prime. Is everyone paying attention so you don't ask me why I have y primes or you don't even notice there's y primes and you use dy over dx's the whole time and never catch this? Why do you have y primes? I'm not doing it. g prime, the derivative of cos starts with a c, so I know it's going to be negative. Derivative of cos is negative sine x, and I would put a dx over dx, so that just cancels, so I don't have to put anything when it's an x, correct? So the one notation actually explains better why we don't put an x prime, but we do put a y prime, because dy over dx is equivalent to y prime, and dx over dx is equivalent to 1. Okay? So we're going to find y prime. So we don't get y prime equals, correct? We just do the derivative. There's going to be a y prime embedded in it, and then we have to isolate the y prime out. That's what you do with implicit. So we do g, which is cos x, times f prime, which is e to the y, y prime, plus, so g f prime times f, g prime, right? And then we equal what? What's a, and then everyone forgets to do the derivative on the other side. You're like, poof, done that, and then you write x plus 1. That's what I see on tests all the time. It's not true. Uh, what's the derivative of x? 1. What's the derivative of 1? Nothing. Okay? So you actually do the derivative of both sides. Most often it'll be like equal to 7, and then people will write 7. No, when you do the derivative of 7, it's actually 0. So watch yourself. People will do all the hard derivatives perfectly fine, and they write equal to 7 and not 0. It really sucks. So, yeah. All right. So we have a negative sign. I'm just going to rewrite these in a form. So usually we have... Um, e to the y cos x times y prime and then minus e to the y sine x equals 1 is usually the format that they write it in. All of these negatives will come to the front because it's multiplication, correct? So my next thing is I'm going to have to move that over. So I'm going to get e to the y cos x times y prime equals 1 plus e to the y sine x divided by e to the y cos x so y prime equals that This is 1 plus e to the y sine x. So the only way that's canceling is if I have a 1 plus e to the y sine x in the denominator. 
right? If they're connected with a plus sign, that's a whole term. So that's only going away if it's in the bottom. If you, if you could go to EY and divide it first and divide it over, because I took EYO starts with both terms, and then I divide it over. It's, that's not a good decision, because you're going to have E to the Y pulled out, moving it over, then adding the sign, then it won't look, it'll be like a piece function, and then you're going to have to take a common denominator and then make it look like mine. So you can do it that way. You just have more work at the end to make it look like mine. All right. Find the equation of the tangent at 0, 0. Go. So m tangent is what I'm going to write over here, not y prime, because I'm finding m tangent. My x and my y. m tangent is 1 plus e to the 0. Now, if they involve an e, and it's in a non-calculator, everyone paying attention, in a non-calculator section of AP, they will often put it to a zero or something like that because e to the zero is just what? One, and I don't need a calculator, correct? Some people are like, well, what if it's e to the 700 or e to the 2.5? Cool, it has to be in a calculator section. Or it can be in a non-calculator, but the answer will be e to the 2.5. Like, you, they can't make you work that down, okay? Not a big deal. So, um, and then sine of zero over e to the zero cos of zero. So e to the zero is one, sine of zero is what? What's y at zero? Zero, nowhere. And then e to the zero is one, and what's cos of zero? One, which is helpful, because it would have been undefined. So we have one plus zero, one plus zero over one, which is what? I know, it's crazy, right? So we get y minus zero, equals 1x minus 0, so technically it's y equals x. It's the identity line. Okay. And there's an AP practice problem on the bottom. And we're doing these ones tomorrow. Well, this one tomorrow, the higher derivative one. We've done rational forms already in that. So that means 